This episode of the Better Every Shift podcast is brought to you by Lexipol, the experts in policy, training, wellness support, and grants assistance for first responders and government leaders. To learn more, visit lexipol.com. That's L-E-X-I-P-O-L.com. Now let's get into the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Better Every Shift podcast. My name is Aaron Zamzow. I am a firefighter training officer. I am your host. I am happy to be here. And with me, as always, the editor-in-chief, the captain that keeps the ship afloat and moving forward, Janelle Fasquette. Janelle, how are we doing today? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Aaron? I'm good. I'm, uh, you know, I'm always excited to do these because we get to talk to some, uh, I want to say, revolutionary leaders of the fire service. Um, every time we do one, I get even more fired up. And today is a prime example of that. Today, we got Dr. Candace Ashby with us, uh, battalion chief from uh, Indiana, Indianapolis Fire Department. Chief, how you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Well, thanks for being here. This is, um, you had mentioned you don't do many podcasts, so we're honored that you're here. Um, but you uh, we're just at FDIC, and you caught Janelle's and my attention, uh, not only because it was a packed house, but just um, the authenticity of your message. And um, for those that don't know of you, they will after this, but um, let me give a little brief overview. You're battalion chief with Indianapolis Fire. You've been there for over 30 years? Is yeah, 33rd correct? year I'm in right now. Mm-hmm. 33rd years. You're the president of Elite Public Safety Consulting and Key Fire Investigations. You speak on leadership from the bottom up. Again, we saw you at FDIC, and we'll talk a little bit about that. You're, you have a doctorate. You, uh, so you're a doctor chief. You have a doctorate in organizational leadership. And you're the grandma to an eight-year-old, five-year-old, and a two-year-old, which um, you said you were just watching them, and it's very similar to the firehouse with the chaos and craziness, correct? Yes, absolutely. So all of this, you, you continue to edu- your education you have an unbelievable journey and story. And I want to get right into that. If you could, uh, you know, you started your, your presentation at FDIC and you, you, when you speak, you, you start kind of of the background and where you came from and what you went through. Can you summarize that for us a little bit, just to give everybody listening a little better idea of, of, of how you came to be? Yeah, absolutely. So I, Indianapolis was a merger. So I started out on the south side of Indianapolis at a smaller fire department. It was four stations, about 110, 20 of us. And then we merged into Indianapolis Fire in 2009. So I went from a small fire department to a big city uh, fire department from four stations to now 44 stations, over 1,300 people. And uh, somehow I worked my way back up through the chain of command. I've been up and down the, the chain of command and through the experiences and the trials and tribulations. Uh, I was, I really learned a great deal going from the small department to a large department. And that's part of the message that I have when I go out and speak, because most people that I speak with are from small fire departments. And I feel that if they could adopt a large department mentality, they'll be much happier and much more productive. So that's how I start out. And, uh, and I, you have icebreakers that I, that I use to see, you know, in the beginning of it to test the audience to see how far I can go and to get them loosened up that this is definitely going to be a firehouse talk. They're going to know very quickly where I come from, and that's a firehouse. And I tell them, you know, uh, 33 years, uh, it, it, I've been in the fire service 37, but career 33. So I started out as sweet, the ripe age of 16 as a cadet. So most of my life has been in a firehouse. And the way that because of the way I talk, it's because of the other people in the firehouse. They've made me who I am today. So I just always wasn't as outspoken as I am now. So what brought that out? I, I, I know that, um, I mean, you've had some challenges, right? Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, along the way, I think a lot of this uh, stems from maybe some things that weren't the best as far as leadership, right? Yeah, that, that's, that absolutely is right. I tell a story during my classroom sessions of what it's like to be a straight woman in the firehouse. And, um, you know, the, the women that came in in the late 80s and early 90s were predominantly gay. And I was on, I found myself as the only straight woman for a time being 
Meaning where that came into play is any any time I got a class or a position, it was because the other people in the firehouse believed that I was having sex with somebody in the administration, mm. where the the lesbians weren't accused of that because there was no women in the administration. So it made for a very difficult journey in the beginning of my career because I had to navigate the seas with that. I was married at the time. Um, and my, I was pregnant with my daughter and in true firehouse fashion, seven different guys were pegged to be the, the father besides my husband. He wasn't one of the seven, but you guys know how that, that plays out. Well, it led to a lot of conflict. Now, I'm not saying uh, this is just one story that I use to try to uh, get the audience to understand the world in which I come from, but we had a lot of leadership issues at this small department. We had a lot of people in positions that shouldn't have been promoted. They shouldn't have been there. They didn't have uh, the organization's interest at heart. There was a lot of micromanaging uh, that went on, a lot of biasness, a lot of favoritism. It led to a lot of infighting. And it got so incredibly bad that people started turning on each other. And that's what happened in my case. So while I'm using this story of, you know, uh, being straight and being accused of screwing other people, it, it actually was because we were turning on each other at that point because we had nowhere else, nowhere else to turn. And that conflict continued to grow and grow and grow until a point that it busted and we were all split up. And then I was sent to a firehouse that I wasn't allowed to come out of my room. Uh, I had to, to stay in my room for the entire shift. I wasn't allowed to eat with them, wasn't allowed to talk to them, wasn't allowed to associate with them. Only time I was allowed out of my room was on a run. And when I did come out on that run, I didn't drive fast enough. It was too slow. My turn signal didn't come on at the right time. Uh, and I stayed there until I was promoted to lieutenant. And then I was sent to another firehouse. Now, Understand this timeline that I'm giving you was about a year from the time that we were split up, that I went to this firehouse and I was in isolation until I got promoted because I was an engineer at the time. And I got promoted to lieutenant. Well, at the end of that year, we actually all started to get along. It just started to break us down and wear on us. And, and it was like, oh, well, it's not so bad. And when I got promoted and sent across the other side of the, the township, I walked into the firehouse on the first day and it all started again. They all got up and walked away. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> this all started again. So a few years later, I was promoted to battalion chief. And the people that I was with at the time that, that created this conflict, they were running as they should have been because there was a lot of ethical issues and stuff. Uh, but I knew in my heart of hearts that, and it was probably one of the biggest willpowers that I've had to exercise is not to treat somebody different that I felt totally ruined my life. I went through a divorce. Uh, my husband at the time wanted me to leave the fire service. I didn't want to leave. Uh, I tried to actually at one point to go law enforcement. That didn't work out for me. And so I stayed in the fire service and I really just had to dig down deep as to why I wanted that position and what the difference that I could make with it. So I, it, long story short, I've been up and down the chain of command, some of it voluntary, some of it involuntary. Uh, and, but I've taken that learning and the things that happen because all of us, all we have is our own story that happens in the fire department. But being around as much as I have and seeing things, and I was, everything that I talk about that's the problem with the fire service today, I've been part of that. And it's not been a, a great journey uh, my entire career. I was part of sitting around the firehouse and, and talking shit about other people. And that stuff has to stop. So when I come into it now, I come into it from an organizational perspective and I get to the root of the problem uh, in, in organizations, a root that's what's really killing us in the organization. But I need guys to understand this conflict is going to be there. But until we understand how to manage that conflict, we're, all we're doing is people that went before us are, it's like we're on a hamster wheel and we are trained to blame somebody else for all of our problems. So uh, everybody's to be blamed. If the morale's low, the performance is low, the productivity is low, we blame the fire chief for the administration. And I come in and kind of blow the top off the class when it comes to that. And I say, we got to put blame on everybody else. and We all need to take a good look in the mirror. And then I use those stories and, and stuff to try to connect to the audience 
and take them down a journey that you have two choices when life serves you uh, little lemons. Uh, you know, you're either going to sit down. It's no different when our kids come home from the first time from school when they see a bully and it breaks our heart and it makes us angry and mad. But what do we do? What do we tell our kids? Oh, I'm sorry. You ran into a bully today. I want you to live in my basement for the next 30 years and become a victim. No, we tell <laughs> right. them that's not what you act like. And that's the things that we have to bring to the firehouse. We have to have more open, honest communication and tell these guys, knock this stuff off and, and let's try to pick each other up and run with it. And if you don't like the top and the fire chief, I mean, I hope you do. But if you don't, what are you doing to change it right now at the bottom of the organization? Because that's where the future is coming from. And oh, my goodness, there's like 85 different questions I have out of all of that. <laughs> But one I want to go back to is when you were at the station and you felt completely isolated and people were isolating you, you know, is that your version of the bully, the firehouse bully? Were they making you feel that you couldn't come out of your room or was it like you were literally directed, like you go from your superior, like you go in that room. I don't want to see you. That's exactly what it was. And that was the harsh time. You know, you don't see, I, I don't feel that you see as much of that today because there's more heightened awareness with social media. But back then, that's exactly what it was. That was the guy's way to ice me out, to run me out of the fire service. And luckily, it, uh, it didn't work. It almost did. They come close. <laughs> and when you said you didn't have anyone to turn to, you mean because it was coming from a superior, essentially. And then who do you go to from there? You know, if especially if it's all men up the chain. Right. And it, yeah. And, and I felt like, you know, I never played a woman Trump card in my career and I, and I never would uh, uh, play the, the woman card, but you know, when I came into fire service, it, it, luckily for me, my dad was uh, very traditional. He was older. If he was still alive, he'd be 95. So he came from a place that women did not get into a man's culture. So I had to get through him when I got in the fire service uh, and that pretty much calloused me up by the time I got to the fireman. It's like, this is nothing. I just went through the old man <laughs> to, to, to get here and stay. But I also knew the reality, you know, I tried to stay grounded in reality. And the reality was I was walking into a man's world. I was a female as bad as I wanted to be accepted and be one of the guys. I'll never be one of the guys because I am absolutely different. Uh, but it, I think it, it just comes into where we let our guards down to say, we're all here for the same reason. You know, it doesn't matter if you're black, white, gay, straight, trans, doesn't man, woman, it doesn't matter uh, that we're all there to do what's you know, and take care of each other. And when we get into the firehouse and you figure out that what's the most important is a guy on your right and a guy on your left, then we start to get it. Uh, and I lose, uh, I use those terms loosely as far as the guys, but um, that's what we need. And, and, there are, it's just like anything else. There are people that are entitled in every single generation. I know we talk more about the millennials today, but I can show you Gen X, I can show you baby boomers who are entitled. The same way with sexual uh, or, or gender, sexual orientation, there's people that wear a chip on their shoulder because of it. And it's like, get that stuff out of here. Uh, you know, we just have to treat people with respect at the end of the day. And so there's a lot of disrespect back then but it was a, it was a school of hard knocks to learn from and and uh, but you know what what I went through helped shape me today as a battalion chief. I really believe that. And, it, and it's directed your you being here, right? Like you're helping well, yeah, other people exactly. through this, which is is great for us. And and yeah. and let me talk about that a little bit and ask. So you're isolated yet you're still prepping for. Uh, you know, you said you wrote for lieutenant, then you wrote for, for like those processes. There are, I'm sure, exams and all these different things. So how did you not, you know, uh, what kept you motivated to continually study and, and do, knowing that maybe this could come back and they could say, no, we're not going to promote you because of, 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 of your sexual uh, orientation or because you were the only female? Well, how I stayed, when I got in the fire service, because I was so young at 16 as a cadet, and I had to go learn everything that I could learn. And then I had to sit and wait till I was 21 to go career. So I had a pretty good five year of training. Here in the state of Indiana, there was what was called the old master categories that you would give the chevrons down the sleeve of all these different uh, state education courses. This is before we went into NFPA that we have today. And I set a goal at a very young age 
Not only did I want every single certification in the state of Indiana, I wanted a hundred more in the fire service because I wanted to have as much as I could. Now, the funny thing is, so to answer your question, I studied early on so much so that some of these guys would constantly badger me that I was book smart and street stupid because I was taking too much education. Because once I got into the career world, it was, you go learn from the street. You don't really take the classes uh, as much anymore. And, uh, and I kept continuing on. Now, in the early 90s, I, w I got my associate's degree in fire science. That's the only thing you could do here in Indiana. I wanted EFO. I knew that was the most prestigious certification at the time that you could have. You had to go to the National Fire Academy to get it. I wasn't allowed to go to the National Fire Academy. They wouldn't give me the time off work, even though it was free. That denial repeatedly is actually what sent me into the direction to get the doctorate degree. Because I was like, fine, if I can't get the EFO, you can't stop me from getting a doctorate. So that's ended up how I wound up with a doctorate degree. And then I laugh about it today. Yeah, I, I'm all about education and certainly about training. But I also tell people, you know, what am I... I'm sitting here paying $125,000 for all this college education. And I got the same <laughs> pension as the guy next to me that has a high school diploma. What did, who's the, the smart one here? <laughs> you know? But then I figured out how to use it. So it's, it's paid off. Right. We were talking about that kind of behind the scenes here too, about, you know, obviously that, that led to, uh, you know, the leadership side that you do some consulting that way you do some consulting mm -hmm. on the investigation side. Um, but kind of, uh, there's a triangle or a pyramid that you talk about during your presentation. And I wanted to, I wanted to ask you about that and, and see if you could uh, start to elaborate a little bit about where that came from. Sure. So I do the triangle, the pyramid to depict the organizational chart in which we work under. So every, you know, public safety organization, we're a hierarchy, we're paramilitary. Um, it is a pyramid shape because there's more people at the bottom than there are the top. And when I come in to do, this was an original class that I did for officer development. And what happened through this class is I started condensing it and taking it on the road. But while I was teaching leadership, I was trying to teach people about organizational leadership because I feel that is something that has been totally missed with social media out there you have people that they're on social media all the time. I don't want to be a manager. I want to be a leader because you manage things and you lead people. While that is true, you have got to understand management 101. I don't care what leadership position you're in. You have got to understand how to manage. You can't just say, oh, I just want to be a leader. It doesn't work that way. So that's how I came into bringing the pyramid into it um, is to bring an element of the organizational um, perspective saying that, you know, you're an organizational leader, meaning that you're a manager. So I depict this pyramid and I divide it into thirds. And I, you know, at the top, you have the administration. At the bottom, you have the operations division. In the world that I come from, there is a disconnect from that top to that bottom. And that disconnect is communications. So the top doesn't understand how to tap into the people at the bottom of the organization and have a uh, real true productivity of the people. This is where the Fortune 500 companies get it because they understand the productivity through the people and they have project teams. Fire service doesn't get it because we're paramilitary. It's very top-down hierarchical structure. So I try to uncover that in a way that makes it very simple to learn uh, and, and just tell people there's this disconnect. So the people at the top, I don't blame them. I, I actually believe it's a fundamental training issue. I really do. But all they hear from the people at the bottom and the people at the top, I've never been at the top. All 33 of my career years has been on the street. I've been asked to go in the office and I, I'm very humbled and flattered to be asked and be considered to do that. I just don't think it's my strong suit, but somebody has to be there. Now we get the people at the top. And what happens is, is they go in and now they're pitted against the politicians to get us what we need. The customers, when we act like idiots on the scene, and then the handful of firefighters that don't like anything that they do, nothing. So all they hear, they're in a constant battle with themselves. I honestly believe, I sit back and watched it. People go in the office 
And it's not a Monday through Friday, eight to five job. It doesn't end at eight hours a day. It's 10, 12, 14, sometimes 16 hour days. It's not five days a week. It's six, seven, sometimes eight days a week. And then they have a tendency when they hear the negativity rise from the bottom that they blanket all of us as a bunch of crybabies and whiners. Now you got the opposite side. You got the people at the bottom. Everything that's wrong with an organization, we blame at the top. We blame those people at the top. And then we and, and that's all that the gravity goes up. Now, with that being said, I believe the majority of people who are sitting at the bottom are good people. Well, throughout the whole organization, they're good people. I'm not saying they're bad at the top. The majority are good people, and just a very small percentage are the chronic complainers and the crybabies. When I do this class, I ask uh, the, the attendees, give me a percentage. Give me a percentage of people that you come into work every single day and it doesn't matter if you hand them a hundred dollar bill, they will complain that it's not 200. They will not be happy no matter what happens. And the, so if I do an average organization, say there's five people at the top and there's 50 people at the bottom, the average percentage I get, no matter the size of the organization is five to 10%, five to 10% are unhappy. So when I draw this pyramid up and I show these guys that there's a disconnect between the top and the bottom, I also need to show them that let's take the upper percentage, 10%. 10% at the bottom are never going to be happy no matter what we do. So now I need the 90 percenters to shut the 10% down by taking away the audience. And they don't. Instead, they, they perpetuate the problem. So then there comes to the middle of my pyramid where I talk about where the where I feel the real problem of the organizations exist, and that's the company officers. I believe the company officers, I and mean, we could sit and argue what ifs all day long, like what's the most important position on a fire department? And you're gonna have someone say, well, the engineer, because you know we can't fight a fire unless we have water going through the hoses. But I really honestly believe the company officers is strength of the organization. And they, have, they are more powerful than any fire chief in existence because they have the power to walk into a fire station and tell somebody to shut the hell up, and they don't do it. It's usually them are the ones that's spreading the negativity and the toxicity, and they're, they're blanketing everybody below them, and that's where the real true disconnect happens. We are disconnected from the top and the bottom, but that's only going to be put together through that metal, through that core of company officers, and then I spin off from that and say, you know, how many how many people out here in the organization are promoted that should have never been promoted? And everybody's like, yeah, there's people like that here. Well, yeah, there's people that have been hired that should have been hired too, right? So what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about these people? We can't. I would love to walk into an organization and say, let's throw in our badges and start over because you guys are really screwed up. Uh, but. Uh, you know, that's unrealistic and we can't do it. But what we can do is we can start training them. Uh, what we're missing on the training is all these good quality classes. Like, yeah, they could be a plethora of leadership classes out there, but where's the classes on management 101? Where's the, where's the classes on communication? Where's the classes on interpersonal relations, conflict management, organizational leadership, expectations and goal setting, customer service? All of those have a common connection and a common thread, and that's how you deal with people. So why we're out here training on the technical part, the advanced, the, the, the aggressive search cultures, that all that's good because that keeps us safe on the scene. We're missing the point of the 90% of the downtime sitting in a firehouse that those officers, and I tell everybody, no matter what rank they hold, every day they walk in the firehouse, whether they intend to or they don't, they mentor the future of that fire department every single day. And how, what are they mentoring the others to do? To complain and blame everybody else at the top? There are tons of bad leaders out there. And no, everybody's like, well, what do you do when you have a bad leader? What do you do? There's nothing you can do about it. But everybody has a boss. The, the, the firefighters have a boss. If they're lazy and they're the complainers out there in the firehouse, why is it the lieutenant or captain coming in and saying, not today? Not on my engine, not in my house, not on my shift. Are you going to act like a turd? If you're going to turn it off, you're going to do what I expect. Um, if it's an officer, you know what? They have a battalion chief. Why is that battalion chief putting their foot square up their butt and saying, no, you got to go train your people and this is what you got to do and you got to show them. Um, and if it's a battalion chief, 
guess what? They've got a boss too. So it's an accountability issue. Mm -hmm. And I, I know there's a lot of classes out here on cultures, <laughs> but it is really what we are ingraining until you get to the root of the problem you'll never be able to change the culture. So that's one of the elements that I try to bring to my classes to get people. And I not only try to get into their minds, I try to get into their hearts to say, listen to me. And you can absolutely, if there's enough of us, we can absolutely make the fire service better. Our department's better, our shift's better, our crew's better. If you just have a change in mindset on what you've been trained to believe and, and undo it. I'll stop yeah. now because you guys aren't asking me no question. I'm getting on a roll because I'm very passionate about this. Well, and that's, that's what we want. I, can I, let me interject real quick though. You said accountability mm -hmm. and I, and I think I, and what, what do you do? So let's say at, at a company officer level, I'm holding someone accountable, but I don't get that support from above. What's, what's the solution to that? And I think I know where you're going to go and answer, but I just want to confirm that I'm thinking at, at it. Right. But. Well, let me just say this. I don't get a lot of support above me, okay? And and I'll tell you why, and I'm very open about this, because I'm a female from a township that was a doctor degree. There are people that are intimidated by the fact that I have a doctorate and I'm sitting out in the street. They think I want their job. I don't want their job. I really don't. I'm in my happy place. Um, there, there's people that, you know, like I told the battalion I'm in now, I bet you never thought you were going to have to work for a female battalion, but I bet you never thought you're going to work for one in menopause. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and now they they have to do that. But it's, it's the way people, per, you know, they perceive and they get jealous in this ego-driven, centric world in which we live. And it's like, golly, let's, let's stop. But the point is, even though I don't get a lot of backing behind me, does that give me the right to show up? Say, I want to be a battalion chief, pick me. I'm the one that signed the, the paper, said, I want to go through the process. Does that give me the right not to back the 15 officers that report to me? So I absolutely, and I, I abs firmly believe and through the core of my being that my job every single day is to go in and work for the 15 officers that report to me. Whatever I got to do to make their job better, their job is to work for their people. And their people's job is to serve the customer on the street. And I want them, I want those officers to have their people's backs. And if they don't, they better get corrected or finding out why don't you have your, your people's backs? Because that's where the team really starts. And, and I have to show, you know, there's things and, and dances I have to do every day. It's, it's not, I mean, I love where I work. I absolutely love what I do, but it's a struggle. It's a struggle every single day not to say, screw this place. Okay. And I really feel that's a fundamental basis here that we go through in our careers. Whatever happens to us, we get promoted, we get demoted, we get this, we don't get that, we get treated unfairly. Get over it. Sorry, it happened to you. But you're going to sit and waller around in that self-pity and victimology for what? The rest of your career and then you're going to affect the rest of us or pick it up and move the hell on and learn from it. So, you know, that's all that we can do. You know, I was one of the stories that I tell, uh, and it's my story, so I'm going to tell it. I was suspended last year, and it's the first time in my career that I've ever received any discipline whatsoever. I know once you know me, you're going to be shocked that I've skirted the discipline process, but <laughs> I, get suspended. I didn't agree with it. I thought it was too harsh, especially when I've never even had an oral reprimand. I mean, it is called progressive discipline for a reason, but it was beyond my control. And even though I didn't agree with it, sure, I could have been mad and stomp around and, and stuff. I was just like, just give it to me and let's move on. And people, they, they, they had a very hard time saying, how can you not be bitter? I said, if I let that get to me, and I say, screw this place. How good will I be as a battalion chief after that with that type of mentality? So the same way with accountability as well. You're going to have people above you that do not have the first damn clue how to do their job. Well, you're going to have to recognize it, own it, and figure out a way around it, how to work through it, or just absolutely learn from what not to be so that you can make it better when you get in that position or get, just get better if you don't take that position. I think it's really important also to note that there are real, real consequences to allowing that negativity and the gossip and all of that to fester in the fire station um, beyond just 
it being uncomfortable and people not getting along and all of that. One of the quotes that I had written down from your class was, if you can't get it together at the firehouse, you won't get it together on scene. And I mean, when you think about that, the application from what's going on at the firehouse, how are you supposed to trust those folks to have your back, you know, when shit's going down on the fire scene, you know, like that's <laughs> when push comes to shove, you gotta, you gotta be there for each other. So that's what I mean, I guess, when I say real consequences. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's just like dealing with people that have time on in 20, 25, 30 years. How many classes are they out here taking? They get, you know, they get the positions that they want. They get the time on and they don't think they have to take any more classes. And golly, shame on them. I mean, we have got to be t constantly training and learning and getting better. It. Oh, I took strategy and tactics back in 1990. Well, guess what? The shit's changed, <laughs> you know? So yeah. it's building construction. It is a full-time job just to keep up with building construction changes. And I don't even know if we can keep it up at that rate. And that affects every single industry affects the fire service. And we have our heads somewhere else worrying about, typically the people on the bottom are worrying about what people are doing at the top. It's out of your control. Get the hell over it. Throw the suggestions up there. And I mean, one thing that I tell my guys is I want them to have open, honest communication. We need to be able to say what's on our hearts and minds. We cannot control the outcome of that. But what we can control is our own attitude, actions, and behaviors to that. So I can go into my fire chief. I literally say whatever is on my mind. He knows it, but it's behind closed doors and it's done respectfully. But he doesn't agree with everything that I say. But you know what? At the end of the day, I know when I lay my head down to go to sleep, I did everything that I could to make a difference. But I'm not in that position. But if I, they don't agree with me, I don't go out and spread it to my 60 guys in my battalion and say, well, I tried to tell them they wouldn't listen to me. What good is going to come from that? So what's interesting about what I do is while it started out as an officer development class and now it's morphed into the entire organization is I do organizational problem solving. So I get so tired of hearing department after department, our morale's low, our productivity's low, our performance is in the tank. It's just terrible because of this lack of leadership. So I go into an organization and I tell a fire chief, if you want to know where the problems are at in your organization, go ask your people. If you want to know what the solutions are to that or to those problems, go ask your people. You don't want to ask your people or you don't know how to, hire me. I'll come in and ask your people. Mm -hmm. So I have the administration stay out of the room. I talk to the, all boots on the ground, whether it's volunteer, combination, or career. If it's career, I do all three shifts. And I say, all right, boys, here's where I came from. This is the world. This is me. And I spend about an hour doing a warm up and then I hand it to them. I say, tell me where the problems are your organization. Now, I've done this dozens of times all across the country. Number one problem in every organization I have done, lack of communication. Number two, lack of accountability. Number three, biasness and favoritism. Number four, micromanagement. Number five, a lack of good quality training. Now this one, let me pause on it since you're a training chief. You're going to like this one. Since COVID has happened, it, it's there and we are in a data-driven culture today. Okay, this is how we get all our grants and everything by checking boxes. Our training has went to a check a box training and the guys are mad about this on the street. They're like, we want good quality hands-on training. I'm like, I'm hearing you guys. And and one thing that I do when I listen to all this is I put it all in a bucket. And then I go to the administration at the end of the three days. And I say, I tell you what, chief and administration, here, you got five main problems, but there's here's 15 solutions to those five problems. So the guys know what I do with the information they give me. I'm very direct with it. But they'll say, we want good quality training. We want live fire training. We want to throw hoses. We want to do this. I'm like, okay, all right, I'm going to go tell your fire chief this. And I hope he listens. And he says, you know what? Every Wednesday, I want you guys out at the training grounds throwing hoses and doing live fire training. And what's really going to happen is half the guys in the firehouse are going to bitch because they have to go train. So while they're bitching that they want training, and then when you turn around and hand it to them, they're going to bitch because they have to go do it. So that is where I come in and I kind of I kind of set off a firecracker right in the middle of that and tell the guys what is really, let's get to the root of the problem 
And the root of the problem isn't the administration. It's us. We're killing each other out here. And the last one is the lack of uh, leadership development training. And I'm like, yeah, no shit. <laughs> you know, because we're not training our officers how to be successful. We're saying, here's your badge. Go figure it out. Some do, some don't. But then we have officers that sit out here on the street. Am I getting blurry? It's blurry on my screen. Uh, that sit out on the yep, street. There you and go. Yep. The, the problems go to the top and then they bitch about it because they step out of the way. And it's like, what are we doing? Because you know what? If the people at the bottom aren't trained, where the hell did the training come from the people at the top? It did. It's not there. They're still missing all these classes. So again, it's where it comes full circle where we're on a hamster wheel. And every once in a while, we spin somebody off, we send them to administration, and then we blame them for every single thing that's wrong. But we never look at how to fix it. So how I think how to fix it is through the fundamental training uh, process and stuff. So I'll stop there so you guys can ask questions. I, I, I got so I got so many things. But I think the first thing, like anybody who's listening, the first thing you need to take from this is you maybe don't need training. You need a mirror. And you need to look at it every single shift, every single day, and and first figure out, all right, uh, and, and this is what I'm taking personally, right? And that's really what this podcast is all about, is just for me to get back, <laughs> which I, I have plenty to uh, to learn it and to do, but I, I, I'm just as guilty, Chief, as you sometimes, right? You get into this rabbit hole where so-and-so up above doesn't see this, or they're not there, and they're not in the firehouse, or they're not communicating, but okay, so what? I, I can't do anything about it. And this is what you're saying. So look in the mirror. What can you do today to be better? What can you do today to keep your crew engaged? What can you do personally? Right? So I think that's the big takeaway I'm getting. First and foremost, look in the mirror. Second of all, you know, yeah, get over yourself, get over the problems. And, and what would you recommend as a second thing? I mean, what, what type of training would you advise someone to go out and seek? Well, if they're in an officer's position or wanting to seek an officer's position is all the soft skills that we don't typically get. The management 101, lead, uh, there, you could take leadership, as you guys know, in a thousand different directions or probably more than that. The decision making, the problem solving, the big one, the, this one it just shocks me and it always has, is team building. Everything we do in the fire service, we do based on a crew or a team, but where's all the team building classes at? And how often do they go on to keep people to have these high-performing teams? This is, And let me pause right here and just say committees. This is where I talk about I don't believe in committees. Now, let me tell you why. As I think it's, this is just something common that happens in the fire service. If we want to know, we want the guys to be involved, we're going to form a committee. And what happens? This is what really happens in, in my world. I can't talk. I can't speak for everybody. Is we'll go be part of a committee. The highest ranking person on the committee gets what they want. And the rest of it is smoke and mirrors. And guess what? The, yeah. It only takes one or two times and people aren't going to stand up and do anything about the committees anymore. They're not going to want to be a part of it because they're not being heard. And it is so incredibly sad. But guess what? Where is the training and project team management? We don't have training in how to even function in a committee. And then we want to know why they fail. Like, no shit. It, it is so, it's like, it's so elementary. But I do believe it, we got to get into these classes, these team building, these interpersonal relations classes. Communications is a big one. We do, we do fire ground communications, but we don't do it from a perspective of how we need to listen more. How do we connect with another person, which is interpersonal relations. Where's the interpersonal relations classes at? This is where the leadership, really the rubber meets the road. And what do we, we want this, you know, when I first started taking classes, I thought, oh my gosh, I want to take all the leadership classes I can because I want to be a leader. Like it was a destination that I was going to arrive at. And it, and it wasn't until I got older and wiser that I was like, oh my gosh, it's a daily freaking grind on how we show up every single day. It has nothing to do with the position that I hold. It's how I carry myself and what real true leading by example means on how we treat the, the next person. And that comes through the interpersonal relations and the emotional intelligence. But those classes are far and few between. And the ones that I have been to, bless the people, you know, I don't, it, there's a lot of instructors out here. And, so, you know, it's, it's like anything else. Uh, people are trying to put their, their stamp on it. Some are regurgitating material from other material. 
and it's a regurgitation process. Well, this is what I've learned by doing all this. But it's very hard for them to put it in the perspective of 24-hour shifts of your career and how to take that from the, the private realm or the theoretical perspective and put it in the practitioner-based perspective and say, okay, we, we do have to live together 24 hours a day. We live together. We eat together. We sleep together. This is not a traditional work setting. However, our administration, they are in a traditional work setting where there's only a few of them doing the job of many and they don't have the time for us out on the street. So how can we start, you know, better and uprighting the ship to that? So I think the first thing is, is uncovering where the real problem lies. And it's just exactly what you said. It's us, each one of us. When we come in and we throw our fellow, fellow brothers and sisters under the bus, that's where the problems have got. We got to upright that. Uh, because we're training the young guys to do that. It's no different than overhaul right now. If you're old enough in the fire service, used to, you were trained to throw out the tarps and actually do salvage. I know that's that's like, I don't even know if they're salvage anymore. But when you made an inspection hole and the studs or the joists were clean, you stopped because there was no fire in it. Now it's how much can we destroy the entire place? And the old guys are training the young guys to destroy, 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 and there's no sense in it. And that's what we're doing mentally to each other. And that it doesn't matter how long you're in a fire service, it'll never change until there's enough of us that say, we are the change. Everybody's like, oh, how about this change? We're the change. We're the culture. Yeah. It, it's, it's no magical pill. I used to think, and this is not to knock anybody's mentoring programs. I used to think when I got into my doctor degree, there was two things I was going to come out with when I finished my doctorate. The first one was a mentoring program. And the second one was a, um, uh, shoot, I lost my train of thought, a uh, succession plan. Those are two things. You talk to any fire chief, that's two things I want. And then it wasn't until I went through everything that I realized it's not the men formal mentoring. It's the informal mentoring is where the real true change takes place. And it's not a written succession plan. We are the succession plan and we need to grab a hold of more people and say, listen, this is what you're doing every single day. You, you're, you're grooming your replacement. And what are you grooming? You're grooming them to be toxic, one of low trust, one of low morale. And it took me a long time. I, I used to think fire chiefs were part of my happiness and my morale. And it wasn't until I was like, no, nobody dictates how happy my feet are when they hit that ground, but me every single day. So I want a battalion. I have seven stations in my battalion, 60 guys, and I want them to show up every single day, happy, ready to do the job, have each other's backs, take care of each other, be aggressive. How do I show up? I show up. I am literally the happiest person that walks in every single day. And then when we work on things together, but that's what it should be like, like, hey, we got each other's backs. So there's things that I do as a battalion chief that's against a traditional norm and how I try to bring the troops together like that. So I, I've got one question on that. You said, we're the change, mm -hmm. you know, we're looking in the mirror, like Aaron said, you know, so if you don't want to wait for the organization to make change, you want to push for change. But if you have a superior who does not support you, how do you take proactive steps without being insubordinate? <laughs> that is a that is a million dollar question, isn't it? So it was funny. Paul Combs came out with a, a cartoon recently. I'd say in the past month or two, and it was a couple of cartoon characters that were jumping into a pool, and it was called the Disruptors. Okay, and I loved it. I actually was showing my XO. I was like, "Look at this. This is what I feel like every day." There are plenty of things that happen that I deal with in my own organization that I don't agree with how it's being done or whatever. And it's all from above me. Now I can either sit down and shut up and say, well, it's on them, but no, I just fire those freaking emails away. I give them my opinion. I, I throw things out there. If it gets, I get slammed all the time, <laughs> get shut down and get shut down. But you know what? I'm going to find a different way to try to get it, to get in there, to get people to listen and uh, to, to get enough guys together to say it might be bad while you have somebody above you at the time, but there is where there's a will, there's a way. And if you can't do anything, because it's a fire chief and they have got, and, and I've worked for fire chiefs that are like this. Um, they got the whole organization in, in a disarray. 
But you know what? There's enough of us down there that take care of each other and continue the classes and stuff so that we, we get people in positions they are ready to take over and they get it. So it may take a while. It may take a month. It may take a year. It may take five years. I don't know. But that's why the class I teach is called Leadership in the Bottom Up because that change is going to take place at the bottom while we're sitting there waiting to get people in those positions. And if we're grooming those young people now out there and say, hey, pull your head out of your ass and act like you got some damn sense. You don't show up like this. I'm telling you, that's more effective than any piece of paper that I've seen so far in my career. At that. Now, I don't mind throwing paper on somebody if I have to. I don't do it uh, you know, a handful of times. It's just an insurance policy if you've got to cha- alter a behavior. But it's like, just tell, call people out and say, and knock it off. And could you imagine the one person sitting at the firehouse dinner table that is throwing other people under the bus and being toxic and negative and say whether they're the boss or not, if everybody got up and walked away? Can you imagine the, the impact that would make on that person because they wouldn't have anybody to carry it. And then we don't carry that stuff to from A shift to B shift to C shift. You're always going to have the people that don't top off the fuel. You're going to have people that eat all the leftovers. You're going to have people that leave the dishes around the firehouse. But we got to get to their officers and say, why? Why why, did, why would you want more for your people? So what I tell my officers is everything you do is a reflection of my leadership. And it really is. And if if you're going to go out and do that, that's a reflection of me. So we're going to have a discussion about it. You know? And maybe I can learn. And believe me, I step in shit all the time. I make mistakes and I just learn from them and move on. But the biggest thing you can do is if you make a mistake is own it. Own it and say, you know what? I screwed up. And, and, and as a battalion chief, if somebody, if I'm getting into somebody's butt because they screwed up and they say, my bad chief, I screwed up. That just took my legs right from underneath me. Cause I, I'll be like, damn, I do that all the time. Yeah. I can't even discipline them. I can't even yell at them for that. Takes the fun right out of it, man. What are you <laughs> doing? Like my grandkids are like, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Sorry, ass. grandma. I didn't, I didn't mean to do that. Um, right, right. But, uh, you know, and it, it, look in the mirror and you have to be open to, to admit fault, to admit when you mess up. Um, and then I think it's part of your, your message too is if, if you're leading me and I see that, uh, Hey, be comfortable enough to ask a question, you have to do it in a respectful manner, but ask the questions, chief, why did you do it that way? You yeah. know, when maybe this is the way it, it's said in policy or this is it, you know, help me understand that a little bit, which then if you're in the right mindset, a good leader, you say, yeah, it's cause I messed that up and Hey, all right, let's, we both just learned something from it and now we're better off. Right. And ultimately we yeah. are happier. We, it's, all, we, we are, we're able to give a better service then. Right. Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and, uh, and there's so many tidbits of information that you just, you, you gave out to us. Um, and we could continue this for about five hours and hopefully we'll <laughs> have a chance to do that at some panel or something someday. Um, but what we do have to do is something very imperative. We have to kind of uh, put you in what we call the hot seat. And now we got 30, like, these are like real quick elevator questions, um, that we like to ask, um, that digs a little deeper into, you know, a little bit about yourself. Right. And a lot of them, I always say come from Janelle's mom and my mom who are our two favorite listeners. We have more than two listeners now. Um, uh, and we will have even more after, uh, listening to you. I'm, I'm a, I'm a full believer in that. So, uh, with that, Janelle's got the first hot seat question for you. Okay. All right. Uh, I want to know what your favorite firehouse activity is to build camaraderie. Woo. I've, I've, uh, I got a lot. Uh, but one thing that I do do in my battalion, the one I just bid a battalion here last year. So the old battalion that I had, we have, um, we had group activities. So, you know, back in the day, the firehouses would get together and play basketball, volleyball and horseshoes and things. You don't see that much anymore. So we pitted a uh, cornhole tournament and we allowed stations to go around other stations and to do that so that they saw each other together having some fun without it being, um, they, you know, without it being on a scene. One of the things that I do as a battalion chief, and, and I'm sorry, battalions, when you hear this, but I'm going to put you on the spot, is I sponsor steak dinners for every one of the firehouses in my battalion. So I just had one last day. Uh, and this battalion I'm in, it's got a lot of double and triple company houses, so it sets me back a little bit. Uh, <laughs> but to come in and actually break bread with the people and get to know to build those interpersonal relations so you can build that trust, so you can have that leadership. 
I think that's probably one of the most powerful uh, things that I do. I have, um, I'll squirrel just for a second. I have ran into those, how do you motivate the unmotivated? How do you make a team out of people that don't want to be a team? <laughs> I have one for that too. It's called puzzles. So I have had people call the union on me and say, and the union call say, well, chief, you can't do that. They filed a grievance. And I'm like, okay, so I'll show up the firehouse the next day. And I stop at the Dollar Tree and I get a 500 piece puzzle. And I walk in and I open it up and I say, guess what? This is battalion chief training. It's called team building. And you're going to sit and you're going to put this puzzle together. And it's fine if you don't want to do it. It's okay. It's called insubordination. And I'm going to be here another 30 years. So I'm going to bring a puzzle back every single day until we get to the point that something's got to give. Um, and then they put the puzzle together. I'm usually hated by the end of it. But then I glue it, frame it and put what they accomplished together. I've also been to firehouses with, that are dysfunctional with team building games and arm. And I've walked in with the team building games and I've done that to break into uh, their world. And and it's it's actually one of the most effective management tools I've used to date is team building games. It's fun in a classroom, but it's more effective as a management tool as well. If that answered your question. Yeah, especially in the more firehouse. More so than you wanted. Yeah. No, no that's, that's perfect. great. Uh, so my question for you in the hot seat is, uh, what are you reading right now to make yourself better? Woo! Right now, I am in a deep dive for high-rise. Uh, high-rise firefighting, anything and everything that I can learn on it. I just got through with Vincent Dunn's Skyscraper Battleground book. And then now I'm going to read Stucky's uh, High Rises and Firefighters. And then I have Jerry Tracy, and there's a couple other authors in their uh, high-rise book that I just bought at FDIC. So when I bid the battalion that I'm in now, I inherited some high rises and I went right straight to my guys because remember I merged into IFD and I said, listen, and you talk about being vulnerable on this. I said, you know how much candy Ashby knows about high rise fires? <laughs> I don't, I don't have, I don't know anything. So I went to uh, Kurt Isaacson's uh, high rise uh, at the uh, CF tactics down in uh, it's called H rock in Pensacola, Florida, and one of the best conferences I've ever been to in my life. I took myself and my XO and I said, come on, we got to learn about high rise training. I bought the books. I'm reading those. Luckily, the people that teach that world, man, they're so open and they just grab everybody and they want to educate them and teach them. So that's what I'm reading right now. How about on personal development? Personal development, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, I oh. think is absolutely the best leadership book out there on the market when it comes to foundational. If you under, if you take it away, like this happened, I believe it happened back in the 1920s. It, that's how old this book yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. It's and, been around for a long time. And he talks about like, how did you become rich? But if you really, and you can go on YouTube I know, and you can listen to the audio book there. Yep. But if you take the money aspect out of it and get to the mindset and the mentality that's actually what I framed leadership from the bottom up on was Napoleon Hill's uh, think, think and Grow Rich. I also just got through reading um, Colin Powell's. Uh, it's Life and Le it's uh, what, what was it called? Um, it worked for me, Life and Leadership uh, by Colin Powell. I think it was probably around 2016. Another phenomenal book. And then, of course, you can't go without Dale Carnegie's uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People because yeah. that's what life is all about. And you're like you said, you take if you take the just take the money out of it and just think about it in general success terms, right? Yeah. Uh, it 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 totally still applies. And that's how they got rich is because they thought it, and then they got there. And that is what the whole bottom up class is about. If you think you can make the difference and you're the change, you absolutely can change your yourself, your crew, and your entire organization. All right, I've got another one for you. When was the last time you laughed really hard with some of your members? At the steak dinner the other night. Uh, they had us rolling. I almost tinkled. I it was <laughs> you remember, remember I said I'm in menopause, I'm getting old. Yeah. Now, but I laughed so hard my stomach was freaking hurting, which and, and so was my exo. She did too. It was the funniest story that they were telling us when they were inside of a fire trying to rescue a couple of dogs and 
I, I, you just can't make something like that up for how they were telling it, but it was hilarious. So usually about every day I go in, there's something uh, hilarious that makes us laugh. Yeah. If you That's can't, great. if you can't laugh uh, at the firehouse, go home. That's what someone well, I, yeah, I read that. that's exactly right. And, you know, and I have to credit Mark Van Alphen a fully involved because he came out with the big four and I adopted that as I have five expectations in my battalion and it's his big four. And then I added one. It's do your job, treat people right, have an all in attitude, give all that effort and have fun. So I had to have fun and I absolutely have a blast every day that I go into work. Well, I got one more leader leadership. <laughs> well, talk about giving it up right away, huh? I got one more hot seat question for you. Um, it, and it's uh, it, it maybe it'll help summarize everything we talked about. What's the number one trait every leader needs? Woohoo! Uh, communication, listening. The number one trait is how to listen to uh, somebody else, I would say, because that's the biggest uh, problem plaguing every organization in the country, not just the fire service is the lack of communications because we, we just don't listen to each other uh, enough. And if I think if we started to do that and it, it really, you know, got our set our egos aside, had a most, and, and the other thing it's going to be right up there is humility because man, I, I've worked with a ton of people. I still work with them today that think the sun surprises and sets in their ass and they're God's gift to firefighting. Um, and it's like, how did the fire go out? They took the day off. Or, or how did yeah, this right. person get extricated from a car? Well, let me say, well, hold I just wanted to go up to somebody. I'm sorry. We can't cut you out because this guy's off. He'll be back in three days. We'll be back to cut you out. No, we don't do that. <laughs> we, we do the best that we can. But, yeah, I think we need to more, more humility and, and people to really take ownership. That's what I love about Isaacson CF Tactics. Everybody that he brought in there is a trainer. It was, and, and this is not a plug for, I mean, it, it, of course it is, but it's not. He don't know that I'm doing this. But every single person that came in there, you just wanted to, they just wanted to grab a hold of you and make you better. And it's just like, wow, how do you have that you can walk around with and say, my job is to see what I can do, not only to make myself better, but how can I make you better? How can I make you uh, smile today? Well, Chief, uh, for those listening, I bet you you just did make us all better. Oh, I, I know you. <laughs> You made me better, and I appreciate you. How can people reach out and connect with you? Well, I have a uh, – even though I'm on the department, I, I have a uh, elite Facebook page called Elite Public Safety Consulting on Facebook for those that have Facebook. If not, it's just my email address, which is uh, C. Ashby, my first initial, last name, at ElitePublicSafety.com. Uh, people don't go through Indianapolis to hire me. They go through Elite Public Safety, which is a nonprofit – uh, to hire, and I'm still shocked today that people want to pay to hear me speak because <laughs> I just go in and say it like I see it, and it's like I said, it's a grandma coming out in me, and <laughs> and I I'm just there to you know I still believe in taking people out behind a firehouse and kicking them right in the ass. Yeah, <laughs> I think that's something we've gotten away from, and we need to get right back to it. And I and I still believe in that. So well, we appreciate your honesty. We appreciate your time. Uh, we thank you for being you and for uh, helping us here uh, and all of our listeners for being better. And I truly think that uh, anybody who listened to this will, will definitely do that. Uh, people can also reach out to us at the show uh, at better every shift at fire rescue one.com. We can, uh, we can also uh, get you in touch with uh, battalion chief, Dr. Ashby. Uh, as nobody well. calls me doctor. <laughs> I just use it when I'm doing a class. You, you had mentioned that your own battalion probably doesn't know that you're a doctor. So I had to say it. I had to just right, right, one more yeah. time. Get I don't it go in around there. and tell everybody that I'm a doctor. I just use it when I'm advertising a class to say, yeah, I paid all this money for those two little initials. Let me use them. But I don't want people to think that I'm an expert or that I know more than what I do because I think they finally got tired of me in the doctor degree. And they're like, just give it to her and get her out of here because <laughs> she's from Kentucky. I can't even pronounce half the terms. <laughs> <laughs> I can hard. I can relate to that too. Yeah, so um, I'm just shocked that I even have the dang degree. Well, again, thanks so much uh, for those that are listening. Thank you for listening. Uh, please reach out. Uh, let us know if there's something we can do better. Please rate and review the show. If you're listening to this on the podcast, remember you can watch this uh, video version, uh, which I highly recommend because um, you know we get some we get some pyramids and we have some uh, symbols and, and and some enthusiasm with our arms here so you can watch us on youtube or fry rescue one uh, but most importantly everybody make sure you look in the mirror evaluate really uh 
who you are and what attitude you're bringing to the table and think about how you can improve, how you can learn something, do something and share something to make you and those around you better every shift. Thanks for listening, everybody. Yeah. And if I can, before you sign off, this is for Janelle. And I say this to everyone in my classes, we got to stop the sneaky, sneaky backstabbing bullshit that goes on every single day. And that in itself will make the fire department better. (laughs) And I can't summarize that any better than that. So stop the backstabbing, look in the mirror, improve yourself and make this a better fire service. Yes. Thank you.